A labor economist definitely benefits, in my view, from having had some real jobs and being in the labor market. Getting top grades at school isn't the only path to greatness in academia. For our guest today, working as a busboy age 13 and in a psychiatric hospital when he was 17, were important steps on his journey to becoming an economist. This is Nobel Prize Conversations, and you just heard Joshua Angrist, who was awarded the prize in economic sciences in 2021 for his methodological contributions to the analysis of causal relationships. He shared the prize with Hedo Imbens and David Card. Joshua Angrist is the Ford Professor of Economics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Growing up in Pittsburgh in the 1970s, he cared more about making money to pay for his car than about going to college. I had very little interest in school. I might have made more of it, but you know, I was a teenager, what did I know? Your host is Adam Smith, Chief Scientific Officer at Nobel Prize Outreach. And this podcast was produced in cooperation with Fundacion Ramon Areces. Taking a break from his scholarly pursuits on Thanksgiving Day, Joshua Angris joined Adam for a conversation about his work and life. They began by discussing publishing and the contrast between the approaches taken in different disciplines. Adam, with a background in biomedical science, was intrigued by the way economists exchange ideas via working papers, rather than always awaiting peer-reviewed publications. How do working papers get published? You just post them on servers? Well, they used to get mailed to you. Even when I was a graduate student, I remember the thrill when I was a second-year graduate student. I, I released my first working paper in my second or third year of graduate school. I was a graduate student at Princeton in the industrial relations section. And that's a venerable place to train labor economists for decades. It has a working paper series. It still does. And you would take your manuscript and you get a cover and it would say industrial relations section, working paper number, such and such. And it would have a certain format and it would get mailed out to hundreds of people, maybe even thousands. And I felt like that was my first publication. I was thrilled. <laughs> and the journal version of it, I think it was published in the Journal of Econometrics, came two years later. So how do you get around the problem of people scooping you on those? Is it just generally accepted? Oh, we, we guard it. We care. Um, the truth is, once I release a working paper, I feel like, you know, my work is done here. I can relax. I'm not worried about being scooped in the pages of the Quarterly Journal of Economics. I'm worried about being scooped. You know, somebody's going to release a working paper that has my idea or my result. It's, I guess it's a, it's a social convention that if I write a working paper and I show you that, you know, exam schools uh, have no treatment effect, which is one of my results, or KIPP schools boost learning, if I get that in a working paper, you have to acknowledge that I beat you. Hmm. You have to acknowledge that I was first. Hmm. It's so interesting because you must all adhere to a sort of standard so that you're not putting out crazy, unthought through ideas. Some people put out crazy ideas. I mean, to some extent, you don't want to regulate that because one man's crazy idea is another man's insight. It's free disposal. You can decide that it's crap. It's true that it's not peer reviewed. So, you know, this became salient during the pandemic. And I think the public struggle and journalists struggle, you know, there is a difference from the point of view of influ influencing public policy the economist journalist or somebody, you know, who's a relatively well-informed reader of our stuff, they should put more weight on the peer-reviewed publication. But that's not the game I'm playing. I'm an academic scholar. I'm happy if The Economist writes up my work, but I don't really care very much. What I care is to get that, get that result under my name mm. and get credit for being the first one to show this or that, whether it's a theoretical result or an empirical result, that's where the competition is for me. I play a game against my peers, and to some extent, it's inward looking. It's about our guild and my standing in the guild. I try to explain this to my students and my young colleagues that everybody likes to appear to be very nice, but um, 
you know, we're as competitive as athletes and, and performing artists. Absolutely. But it's interesting to compare the biomedical fields with economics. In economics, you've obviously got a very sophisticated system of sharing pre-published data, if that's what working papers are. They're just finding their way in biomedicine. In physics, they've had it for a long time. In physics, they've yeah, had it. Some, some disciplines have it. I mean, you know, ultimately, it, it's the reputation of the scholar that, that is the collateral. I might present a paper in a seminar that I'm not too sure of and just sort of see how it goes and get some feedback. But I won't release an NBR working paper or our lab has a series until I'm pretty confident of it. You know, at that point, I feel like I think this is the right thing, the right answer. This is what we found. I'll stand by it. And then, you know, my readers believe that. They, they think, OK, if this is one of Angus working papers, you know, it's probably worth taking seriously. And of course, I'm hardly the only scholar that people would say that about. And I think that's the equilibrium. And it is kind of an equilibrium. It could break down. I can see how it works. And uh, yeah, I remember when, when we were at an early stage of preprints in biomedicine, we'd turn to the physicists and say, how come you trust each other so much? You know, how, how come there isn't more crazy data hitting the preprint servers? It does require people to be very regulated in the way they they put material out. No, I think it's not that so much. There, there is so no. What it is is that the readership is sophisticated and discounts, you know, the crap. Not always, but you know, scholars have reputations. That's ultimately what we have. But do you ever sit down with your colleagues from, for instance, the natural science departments and talk about things like how publication varies across your disciplines? No. No, I don't know that they would care what I have to say. I wouldn't care much what they had to say about my world. <laughs> I'll tell you where, where that interaction happens. Academic disciplines are very balkanized. My interaction with people from other fields in my, is through university level committees. You know, and, and I find sometimes people that see things the way I do and sometimes not. I, I would say often the engineers are sort of predisposed to a, a view of personnel issues or something like that, or curriculum issues with which we're more aligned in my department than say natural sciences. And a lot of my interaction with other disciplines at MIT was through the serving on a curriculum committee. And I was often in conflict with my scientist colleagues because we have a lot of required science. And I think that's bad for our students. And I know it's bad for our department. Why? Uh, why is it bad? Hmm. I mean, first of all, you have to understand that in America, it's really the undergraduate programs that sort of drive the engine. That's what makes a school prestigious or not. To some extent, resources follow undergraduate enrollment. So when they're giving away buildings and that sort of thing, or slots, you know, that's driven much more by undergraduate enrollment than graduate enrollment. It's also the undergraduates who go away and become, you know, who found Dropbox and <laughs> yeah. then give generous gifts. You know, we have this sort of system of giving back and that doesn't come from the graduate students. Graduate students cost us a fortune while they're here and they don't give us a dime when they leave. So I have to admit, I don't quite understand the business model behind our graduate program, but the undergraduate program I would like to improve because I think, first of all, we don't do our students a, a service if we give them a lousy product, but also it's good for our department because many of those people are people we would like to see us as somebody who helped them get their start in life. And now they're very successful. And so MIT has the most draconian science requirements, I think, of any undergraduate institution besides maybe Caltech. Every MIT undergraduate has to take two semesters of calculus, two semesters of physics, a semester of biology, and a semester of chemistry. So that's six required science classes. And then these, these of course, are people you don't get into MIT if you didn't do well. You know, we have AP courses, advanced placement in high school. So you already, you took AP physics, you took AP calc, you know, you took AP, but then we make you take that. You can get out of some of them, but not all of them. And it is hard to get out of them. So everybody then fills up their freshman year with those courses. Well, that means they don't have time in their schedules for Econ 101 hmm. or statistics. So I push back against that. I think, first of all, it's intellectually I don't see the intellectual case for it. Why is it so important that I, that I take biology? I never took biology since 10th grade. 
why is it so important that I took chemistry? What's the argument for it then from your colleagues? Uh, well, the scientists say you need to know this and I'll say why. Well, they have a very parochial view of the world in my view. You know, guys of chemistry thinks you need to know chemistry. So it's Thanksgiving and you're talking to me. Mm -hmm. Do you work all the time? Yes, I never stopped like, thinking about my work. So I have family, you know, my parents are coming. Well, thank the Lord, my parents are in good health. They can fly and they're coming for Thanksgiving dinner. But we'll actually have the Thanksgiving dinner tomorrow mm -hmm. because it just works better for everybody's schedules. Mm -hmm. But I'll work today and tomorrow. Today and tomorrow are good days to talk to your European <laughs> friends because they don't have That's right. Thanksgiving. So I often time things like that. So Christmas or whatever is a good day to do some things for some people. You sound like my dad. He was always very miserable on Christmas Day because he, nobody would talk to him. He couldn't get on with any work. Well, it depends what you do. What did he do? He was a writer and an explorer. So he could write? He could write on Christmas Day. Well, he, yeah, but he was also always planning expeditions and he wanted people oh, to be I talking see. to him about going off to the Amazon or wherever yeah. he was going. Yeah. I see. No, it's true. I I'm, I'm also see myself as a writer and I'll certainly be writing on you know, the holidays. I think the thing about him was, although he was a writer, which is a solitary occupation, and then an explorer, mm -hmm. which is a communal occupation. He always needed pals around. He always wanted to be talking to people to stimulate his thinking. And mm -hmm. is that the same for you? Do you like? Yeah, I like to have colleagues. And yeah, I'm not a solitary worker, though there aren't many people in the office today. There are a few. Yeah, I like to sort of not, you know, I like the transition from at home. You know, it's harder to think about work. And I have grandchildren now who I love to be with, but if they're around, I'm not not going to be very productive. So I like to work at the office and then I like to see people at the office. We have a lab and I, I like to see my lab mates, both the academic peers like Parag Pathak and David Otter. And there's the staff that manage the lab and there's the un younger folks that are our research fellows. What does the lab look like? What, is it, what form does it take? Physically? Yeah. It's a, it's a workspace. It's, a, you know, it's office space. So it's got a lot of computer workstations. It's got a secure data room that's sort of physically secure. It's a little anachronistic, but some of our data providers require a very high level of security because we're working with financial records and that sort of thing. And the managers have offices there. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's nice. We're, we're about to get a whole bunch more space. So we'll have our own conference rooms. Right now we share conference rooms with other people in that building, which is fine, but we'll have nicer space. All, all testament to the success of empirical research. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're somewhat the future, I think, or the current, the present. The, uh, you know, economics has moved more like the life sciences, not in the journal culture, but in the, the sort of lab culture that the kind of work that I do now, I need workers to help me. Hmm. It's not me, you know, sitting in a cafe with a pencil. First of all, getting the data is very complicated and you need to execute data agreements that are legal documents. So somebody has to help draft those and be experienced with those and act on our behalf. And then, you know, we have a lot of computing infrastructure and we have a crew of research assistants. So there's human resources concerns related to the hardest thing is to find those people and convince them to come. And then somebody has to guide them. The PIs work with them, but, but they need also additional yeah. hands-on interaction. So you become a manager to a certain extent. Yes, yes. Yeah, I do very little of my own empirical work in terms of actually running regressions the way I did, you know, or computing estimates. Uh, you know, when I was a grad student, I did my own empirical work. And I have, an, I have a thing in my Nobel lecture at the end about that. I mean, that now, you know, my, my research, the, the lab employees, they're really good programmers, they're professionals, and they use a lot of modern programming tools. You know, I don't know how to do that. So the only coding and, you know, the only hands-on data analysis that I do personally now is for my classes. Mm. You know, I want to show an example and I'll work the example myself and try it five different ways until I'm happy with it. But the research computing is done by professionals. Some people don't like this. I, I like it. I think it also plays to my strengths. 
by the standards of academia, I think my colleagues and I are good managers. You know, and now we're sort of leveraged through this, the lab idea. Joshua Angrist's award-winning work includes creating new methods to extract accurate information from so-called natural experiments. In contrast to a controlled experiment, which is created by the scientists from scratch, a natural experiment uses data from the social and economic developments that are happening around us. It helps us answer questions like, how does immigration affect labour markets? Or, how does class size in school affect achievement? These methods have revolutionised empirical research in social sciences, according to the Economic Sciences Prize Committee, who named Joshua Angrist as one of the 2021 laureates on the morning of October 11th. How has it been since that morning announcement? It's been pretty hectic, actually. I know it's it's kind of churlish to be grumpy about your Nobel Prize, but and lots of people would, would be happy to have the problem. Hmm. I did feel sort of overwhelmed in those first couple of weeks and occasionally still, but not as much. It, you know, it's wonderful to win the Nobel Prize, but, you know, I'm, I am the same guy I was on this October 10th. So in some sense, there, there's a surreal quality to it where all of a sudden, you know, the same person and now my time is, you know, of interest to so many people and not the usual people also, but a much broader sure. set of people. And now you're faced with the challenge of deciding, you know, who you can accommodate and so on. And then I had a lot of commitments from before and I hate to cancel. Now I'm too busy. I'm a Nobel laureate, you know, but on the other hand, I have to make some choices. So I'm sure every laureate, you know, confronts this, of course, but there is probably a difference in age. You know, I'm not retired. I'm teaching. So, you know, I'm still trying to do everything that I was trying to do before teach and write papers, and then I'm trying to do these other things. I wanted to talk about your start in all this because it it wasn't, I mean, listening to you talk about your work and how, how comfortable you are and how you work all the time, it sounds like you've been doing it forever and it was you sort of were born to do it, but you weren't quite born to do it and it took some finding and that's interesting. Mm-hmm. And also perhaps comforting for people who, Mm -hmm. um, especially raising children and wondering how they're going to do at school. And then you weren't a classically sort of top rated high school student. Definitely not. I'm more like a high school dropout. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So you you left school early, but you did graduate. But how did you graduate? I got a diploma. Well, you know, when I was in school in the 70s, it was easier to get out of school with a diploma probably than it is today. Um, I didn't like school. I wanted to work. I needed money. I wanted money. Also, I had already worked. I started working when I was 13. What did you do? Then? I was a busboy, you know, in restaurants. And I had lots of jobs. My dad encouraged me to work. I don't think many parents do that. My dad had also worked from a young age. He said, I wanted money. He said, well, you should get a job. So I, I got a job working as a busboy when I was 13. It was illegal, of course. It was like child labor and everything. But a bunch of my friends worked in a restaurant. It was a private club. It probably had some mafia connection with a lot of local politicians ate there. And then one Christmas Eve, it burned down. <laughs> um, so we used to work Friday and Saturday nights, you know, from 5 p.m. to about two in the morning and got paid a dollar an hour plus tips, plus all the beer and cheesecake we could steal. And I liked that a lot. I liked having money and I liked working to some extent. And then I did a bunch of other jobs. Um, I was like a telephone solicitor. I drove a jitney one summer. Um, so you drove a what? A jitney is an illegal cab. Okay. Yeah, the cab company in Pittsburgh, where I grew, grew up, the airport's far away. Okay. And you, so you'd like to, you know, you need a taxi. Yeah. And I mean, there's like a bus, but you know, so some people would want to take a taxi, and the taxi company went on strike. And I remember I was getting my hair cut that summer, and people were complaining about that. I said, "Oh well, you know, I'll take my dad's car and I'll." and drive people for 50 bucks and that was better you know that was good that was a good job it sounds great but it, presumably you weren't 13 when you did that one <laughs> no i was 16 wow 16 or 17 and um well you get your driver's license when you're 16 so that was fun so i was always into like finding ways to make money and then in school i had very little interest in school 
I might have made more of it, but you know, I was a teenager. What did I know? And so I figured out, I don't know how I figured this out, but I wanted to go work full time. By then I was interested in mental health issues. I had worked with mentally handicapped people in the summers and I thought I'll just do that for a job. And I figured out that in Pennsylvania, the only graduation requirements at that time were health, kind of like sex education, gym, you know, physical education and English. So I took two healths, two gyms and two Englishes in my 11th grade and I got a diploma. And I didn't take any sort of ever college prep classes by then. It was a handicap when I got to college because I didn't really know a lot of basic math. I was trying to take calculus, but I didn't know trig and sort of more advanced algebra. So I had to get tutor. But I worked for a while, then I went to college. And then I discovered economics in college. I just loved economics as a subject. I had a very good teacher for 101 that got me excited. I want to follow that up in a second, but I'm just interested in the wanting to work with in mental health. We wanted to make money, but Mm. classically working with people who have learning difficulties or mental health issues is not a great way to make money. It is when you're 16 or 17, or maybe I was 17, 17 or 18. You know, in the sense of my standards for making money were low. I was living at home. And really, my concern in life was to support my car. I wanted to have a car. I liked having a car. Car is expensive. I had to not only pay for the car, I had to pay for get it fixed. I was constantly wrecking it. So there was, and the insurance and everything was high. And gas, you know, was expensive then. And so that was kind of, I had a very narrow view of what it meant to make money. And then I had, a, you know, once I started working full time, granted it was, you know, minimum wage or a little better, but it was full time. Mm-hmm. And then I passed the state civil service exam, I think, and I started working in state mental hospitals. So it was, it was enough income for a teenager. I did come to see that it, maybe there wasn't much of a future in it. And, and I thought I should go to college. That made my parents happy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can absolutely see, yes, yes. And then in college, I, I liked economics and I, I wrote an undergraduate thesis and I liked that a lot. So what was it about economics that just appealed? I don't know, it, I connected with it. I liked both economics and econometrics. I took undergraduate econometrics. I had a wonderful teacher, Luis Fernandez. Already, I kind of liked labor economics, even though I didn't take a class. My advisor was a labor economist, Hirsch Casper. And I saw that it was a sort of systematic way to think about the world. I was interested in social affairs. I wasn't very interested in physics and things, stuff like that. Biology, I found incredibly tedious. I didn't even take those things in high college anyway. I took them in high school. The natural sciences I took in high school, I found tedious beyond words. I did sort of come to like math in college over the course of my career, though it was a struggle. And economics came to be just much more naturally. So you, I guess you like what you have maybe some ability for. I kind of understood the whole setup of modeling things and trying to estimate things connected with that. And then as an undergraduate at Oberlin, they have an honors program where, you know, sort of the top undergraduate majors are invited to do a thesis. And that was a key experience for me. And I got interested in my, I did a kind of an applied thesis on sample selection bias and wage equations. And I was reading journal articles by Heckman and Ashenfutter. And, you know, I really liked that a lot, though I didn't go to graduate school right away, Hmm. but I got a taste of what it would be like. You went to Israel, presumably. Yeah, I went to Israel. I was a student at Hebrew U for a year. Not very good student. Again, in their master's program, I dropped out of that. I joined the army. My, I had moved to Israel with a, my best friend from high school, Mike Drescher. We decided we're going to join the army, become Israeli citizens, join the army. And we did do that. Working in state mental hospitals is an incredibly important thing to do. And had you stayed in that world, I guess you would have done important things there. But it sounds, listening to your story, that there was a kind of transition, that it was a sort of intellectual awakening on arriving at Oberlin. Did it feel like that at the time, or did it just feel like a natural progression without any kind of discontinuity? I don't think there was a discontinuity. I was definitely, as young people do, looking back on it, and I've seen it through my own child rearing, 
you know, people mature in the late teens and early 20s. And there's this view when you're a teenager that you're both immortal and you know everything. And, you know, it's hard to take guidance. It's hard to give such a person guidance. I know that as a parent. But then you sort of, you do mature, most people anyway. And you see maybe there are some things worth investing in that are going to take longer. And there's more to life than covering your auto insurance. <laughs> uh, and yeah. there's interesting um my time in london was also a maturing experience for me because i was a junior i'd never been overseas and the lse was like a dramatically different place than oberlin first of all it's very urban but the school you know undergraduates read journal articles there they don't get it just color-coded textbooks you know, color big print textbooks and pre-digest it. So that was really my first exposure to scholarship, I think. I had a wonderful tutor, Partha Dasgupta was my undergraduate tutor. I didn't know to appreciate it at the time. I just thought, what a sweet guy. But he he did help me out a lot, sort of find interesting things to read. Hmm. And then the whole system in the England where you know, here in the U.S., even at MIT, you, you take a class, you have a midterm, and a final, and problem sets, and this all goes into your grades. So your, your risk is very diversified. You know, at LSE, you take game theory all year, and then you have one exam, and you pass or fail, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody really cares what you do in the meantime. Yeah. That's a much more adult experience. So I, that was also a turning That was my junior year of college. And then when I went back to Oberlin, I wrote a thesis as an undergrad. And that's where I met my thesis advisor, Orly Eschenfelder, who was the outside examiner. Somebody comes to Oberlin to interview, sort of give an oral exam. And that's a nice feature of that program. And that was Eschenfelder in my year. And Orly invited me to Princeton. And eventually I kind of cashed in the voucher that he gave me. It sounds like all these experiences they gave you a sort of pragmatic approach. Maybe it's being in the Israeli army for a while. Maybe it's being a bus boy or driving illegal taxis, but somehow, because listening to you talk about your work, again, it's it doesn't sound easy, but it sounds like you've got it all sorted. It's sort of, you know, there, there's not too much complication there. And I guess pragmatism is something that you get from experience. Well, I don't know. I'm a very concrete thinker. I don't like pure abstraction very much. I get very impatient with that. So if somebody tells me they have a model of the labor market or something, I'll say, well, tell me the occupation that kind of works like that. And then maybe I have a view because I've seen that occupation through mm. somebody's eyes, my own or somebody I know. Mm. I think a labor economist definitely benefits in my view. I haven't studied this, but it's my instinct from having had some real jobs and sort of being in the labor market. And, you know, I think, for example, I benefit now as I'm involved with hiring people, both for the lab and, and then we have a startup, Frog and Me and we have to hire people. And I think that sort of forceful confrontation with real world labor markets helps my thinking about the labor market. That sounds like yet another causal relationship to uh, study. Well, I, I hesitate to draw too many conclusions because you know it's a sample of one. So actually I often tell my students not to learn too much from their own experience because they're unusual people and their lives are not necessarily similar, particularly in the economic sphere, to the economic life of a typical person. You know, my military experience, for example, is in contrast with my thesis. So I used the draft lottery to estimate the effects of serving in the Vietnam era armed forces. And the finding there, which is quite clear and striking, is that men who were conscripted suffered an earnings loss that persists into their middle age. Mm. And it's about what you would expect if you took somebody out of the labor market for two years because earnings rise as you get older. But my own military experience wasn't bad. And, you know, I'm not sure it was a net loss for me. Yeah, that's a very interesting example of that. And OK, last question then. A piece of data like that, like you're finding about the effects of the draft, is politically very sensitive. I would say it's relevant. I don't know if it's sensitive. Okay. It's relevant relevant for policy. So when you come up with data that is relevant for policy, that requires a whole different set of skills to try and make use of that and to try and get people to listen to it. 
And is that also something that you very much enjoy? Do you? Do you I, like I don't forward? mind that, but it's not my comparative advantage. It's not what I do best. I would much rather you write a story about my work, <laughs> meaning a yeah. professional journalist, say, than me write an op-ed and try to get that on the editorial page of mm -hmm. some major outlets. And very rarely will I do the op-ed. Actually, the draft is one case where I did do that. So my draft lottery paper did appear in the media. When I wrote that paper, the draft was more recent in people's memories. And the all-volunteer force started in 1975, roughly, and got off to kind of a bad start and only had sort of smoothed out by the 80s. So a bunch of people wrote up, like I remember Alan Blinder did a story in U.S. News and World Report, you know, my results. And I think that helps solidify the intellectual case against the draft. Mm -hmm. Milton Friedman had said that the draft is a tax on soldiers who are drafted. You know, there's people who would be happy to serve for money. And by definition, if you're forcing somebody in, you're not paying them enough to get them to volunteer. And the difference between what you pay them and what they would have to be paid, that's like a tax on them. And I think my empirical results kind of validated the view that that's that there is a penalty. Mm -hmm. There are people who are willing to serve for pay and benefits. And most soldiers are volunteers. That was true even during the Vietnam era, but then there was a substantial conscripted cohort as well. But I personally didn't really want to be the one writing those articles. You know your limitations, but uh, although you oh, It's not, I, I have opinions like everybody. I have opinions about politics and policy, but I don't feel like that my opinions are privileged except in the area that I really study. Anyway, I also, I promised Parag I wouldn't become a public intellectual. <laughs> well, you're gonna, you, well, that's the struggle because it's not your fault. It's the world's fault asking you to do it all the time. You know, you, what's right. your opinion on this? What do you say about this? You know, somebody asks you what brand of Hoover you use, it will become a... Yeah, what brand of shirts you wear. Isn't that yeah. insatisfaction? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Or, um, or Major Tom. Right. Yeah. Oh, Major Tom. That's right. Yeah. Both, I think. The shirts line is in both. Yeah. Who, who stole it from who? Bowie or Jagger? <laughs> <laughs> both have a good line in shirts. So. <laughs> <laughs> what an enormous pleasure to speak with you. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks so much. Great to chat with you. You just heard Nobel Prize Conversations. If you'd like to learn more about Joshua Angrist, you can go to nobelprize.org, where you'll find a wealth of information about the prizes and the people behind the discoveries. Nobel Prize Conversations is a podcast series with Adam Smith, a co-production of FILT and Nobel Prize Outreach. The producer for this episode was Carden Svensson. The editorial team also includes Andrew Hart, Olivia Lundquist, Magnus Yulier, and me. Claire Brilliant. Music by Epidemic Sound. If you're looking for more listening, check out our earlier conversation with Paul Milgram, who also became an economic scientist laureate despite not impressing his teachers in school. You can find previous seasons and conversations on ACOST or wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening.